Hello, I'm Lucy Beadnell with the ARC of Northern Virginia, and for today's dual live in-person workshop and webinar, we'll be talking about consumer-directed attendance. A question we get here at the ARC daily is how do we find and maintain and train the very best people for this job, and if we need to, how do we let go the wrong people for this job? So uh, as our panelists here will tell you, we don't have any magic pool of people who are like just chomping at the bit to make not very much money and get no benefits to do this job, right? <laughs> um, but looking at things creatively, um, really engaging people, there are lots of things that you can do to make yourself as successful as possible and explore and getting the very best care attendants for you. So when we look at consumer-directed services, that's a term I use a lot because it's the term that the Medicaid waiver system uses. And what that really just means is that the person with a disability and their family member are working together to directly choose who's going to work with them, as opposed to, say, for example, contracting with an agency and you telling the agency, send someone during these hours. With consumer-directed services, you're choosing exactly who it is that you want to be there, either because it's someone you know already or someone you go out and find. Uh, Medicaid waiver pays for that care attendant through a group called a fiscal agent. They're your HR department, if you will. So those are the people who run payroll and manage timesheets and tax reporting and all the IRS hiring forms and all those other kinds of things. Uh, and then families work with the care attendants to, to be the on-site employer, if you will, to sign up on timesheets to make sure everything's working the way that it should, that kind of thing. Um, this Functionally, all of the information that we'll talk about today works the same if you're not using a waiver. So if you're just saying, we just are looking to pay someone out of pocket to provide some care. So all those pieces um, that we'll really talk about today, the creative ways of hiring and finding and training the right people are the same, and you just save yourself all the bureaucracy at the cost of having to pay for it, right? So that's, that's the pro and con of it. So though I'm using the term consumer directed because that's what the waiver uses, again, this all applies pretty much universally if you're hiring someone. Um, of course, the advantages to this are you have total control over, as you're the person with a disability or their loved one, who's going to be touching you or in your life or in your house and in your space and all those kinds of things that are really very, very personal. Uh, and so obviously that's tremendously important. And you have an opportunity to train someone to have the skills you want them to have. Because of course no one is an autism expert and knows how to support any person with autism and anything that they're going to do, right? And sometimes there's a danger in hiring someone who thinks they're an expert in a certain kind of field um, because they may be less flexible or less willing to learn the kinds of things that you want them to. So it's a real opportunity to kind of shape the sort of person that you want um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, or our panelists will, but there's a tremendous opportunity to hire someone not just because of their background and skills, but because of their energy and interest. And some of the greatest matches that I ever saw when I was a case manager were people who, for example, were taking art classes and hired someone who was an art student. They wanted to go to the classes. They had shared things to talk about. They really enjoyed their time together. That person wanted to come to work. It was a resume builder for them, not only because they had a job, but because they had a job in their field. They talked about working with someone in a therapeutic way on art. So there's all kinds of neat advantages to that, um, to that kind of end. And then as well, sometimes with consumer-directed attendance services, you can hire people who may not be doing this as a career because perhaps they're college students who have hours on the nights and weekends or teacher's aides or other kinds of people who really already have lots of great experience, are smart, are good problem solvers, are really interesting and dedicated to this, but may not stay in this job for years and years and years because their circumstances mean they're going to be around for a year before summer break or whatever. And as lots of families who talk to use consumer-directed services would tell you, like, that's something that you weigh. Right? Is it worth it to me to have this person who's like really cool and fun and roughly my kid's age and they go out and they do things, but I know in eight months I'm going to start this process over? Or is it worth it for me to have someone um, who's more steady? Uh, again, someone who frequently hires child care providers. Nothing's guaranteed. <laughs> uh, so just a quick look here at the major players involved. And of course, the person with a disability should be at the center of all this, choosing what people are involved and what's exactly happening. So family and loved ones kind of start off, and they should be working as a team with this person to figure out what are the hours you need support for? What do you want someone to be doing with you? What kind of person do you want that to be? And starting with that conversation. 
And then that person's using a waiver, working with their support coordinator to say, hey, here are the hours that we need support. Let's write up a plan. Let's get all that authorized. And once that's approved, then you work with your service facilitator. And you say, hey, service facilitator, you're going to help me with all this paperwork and getting things done and knowing who my attendants are and ironing out any kinks that we have in the process and those kinds of things with our fiscal agent. Uh, as a quick tangent here, public partnerships, often called PPL, is the fiscal agent that's worked with Virginia's Medicaid waiver system for a very long time. Um, in fact, the Consumer Directed Attendant Guide that there's copies of on the table and that folks on the webinar were emailed in advance and that exists online in our resource library, if you're listening to this after the fact, talks a lot about public partnerships in specific because they have been around for so very long. But just last month, Medicaid announced that for people using certain kinds of waivers and certain kinds of services, they're moving to a new fiscal agent. That doesn't change the core of what we're talking about here, because what we're talking about is what this looks like from the side of the person with a disability and their family finding the right match and all those kinds of things. But that nitty-gritty sort of stuff um, is important too. And so we'll be updating that in our consumer directed attendant guides come the start of next year as all that kind of piece plays out a little bit. So that's the start of 2019. Uh, and then Medicaid and your managed care organization in our green little hexagon here are going to be paying these people. And then of course you have your care attendant. So this is just to give you a sense of there are lots of hands in the pot. Uh, and as Hillary and Donna and Kimberly and everybody here can tell you, anyone can drop the ball in this, right, which can hose things up for everybody. So I think <coughs> it's important to see this all together and be thinking, Everyone who's up here should be talking together, should have contact information for each other, should know each other, should be planning as a team, um, and be as updated as possible on when there are glitches in the system and when new people are being hired and all those kinds of things to make sure that things are flowing as seamlessly as possible, and when they aren't, that the right people are really well informed quickly. Question for clarification. So, I know most of who these are. Mm -hmm. uh, the confusion I have um, is I'm not sure what's the difference between the support coordinator and the service facilitator. Sure. So the support coordinator, if you have one of the DD waivers, is the person who works for either the county community services board where you live or the private nonprofit, for example, the Ark of Northern Virginia. If you have the CCC Plus waiver that used to be called the EDCD waiver, I know this acronym is just terrible. We're already swimming in it, aren't we? Uh, then you don't have someone who fills that role. Okay, that's okay. Uh, no matter what waiver you are using, you have a service facilitator if you're using consumer directed services so that you're not just on your own figuring all of this out all the time. That's kind of your person to talk to and check in with on a routine basis that's making sure things are humming along for you. So for folks here in the room, and again, online resource library or emailed in advance to folks on the webinar, we have a consumer directed care attendant guidebook. Um, that really overviews the kind of things that are up here on the screen now. So uh, planning ahead to make sure that you're finding the right people, you're avoiding traumatic experiences, you are well equipped to do all those kinds of things that you need to be doing, um, answering questions, uh, care, you know, timesheet, nitty gritty, all that sort of business. All right. So I'm so over me yapping. I'm going to turn this over to our panelists who are really going to share a little bit about each of their perspectives, situation, experience working with consumer directed services. And then um, after they all have a chance to lay a little bit of that groundwork, we'll open it up to questions both from folks in the room and folks online. So we'll let them get going and then um, they'll kind of sort out amongst themselves who's the best person to answer questions. And sometimes it's multiple people. Like I said, there's no magic fairy dust that we have on how to do this well. It's um, we hope everybody leaves here with kind of a, a few new tips and tricks in your toolkit to make this a little bit more successful in the future and a, and a really good perspective to approach all of this. So Kimberly, would you like to take it away? Okay. My name is Kimberly Deloach, and I actually work here at the ARC in our travel training department. Um, but I'm very fortunate today to be here with my son, Charlie, for the first time we're presenting together, and our personal care attendant, Raji. Um, just a little bit about me uh, and Charlie's situation. Charlie is um, extremely medically fragile, although he doesn't look it, because he has such great care at home. And his nurse, Merita, is in the back of the room. And we have, um, we have, I don't even remember now because Medicaid just cut us and the appeal process is going through, but we have like 12 hours, 16 hours. We used to have 18 hours of nursing per day. 
Um, and then there's that six hours that was left between 4 p.m. and 10 p.m., um, we decided to hire an aide about probably six, seven years ago. We've had nursing now. How old are you, Charlie? 15? Um, um, 15. Yeah, so we've had nurses in our home for about 12 years. Um, so we've been hiring, we've been doing both. We did agency, we do agency with the nurses, and we do consumer directed with um, our aide. Uh, right now, currently, we have Raji as our aide, and we're going into our fourth year with Raji, which is amazing. And uh, Charlie and Raji are going to tell you a little bit about uh, them, and then I will come back and answer some questions, um, like the most frequently asked questions I get. Um, at the, after they do their presentation, because Charlie is chomping at the bit to do his. So are you ready? Yes. All right. Hello. My name is Charlie Delos. I have fun with Raji. We go to the store and the movies. We watch my dog. Cookie Bear, Raji is my friend. Thank you. As you can tell, um, we have two best friends here, uh, more so on this side, I think, for, for Raji. But uh, um, Raji actually works several jobs, and so in the summer especially, I'll tell you why. Um, we don't have Raji on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and boy, do I hear about it every single day of when is Raji coming next. Um, and even today, uh, Mirta was here, and it's Mirta's time, it's nurse's time, and for his feedings, Charlie is fed um, through a G-tube. He would not allow her to do so because he knew that Raji was going to be here. So <laughs> thank God Raji came early, and we had time to do the feeding. <laughs> So I'm going to let Raji do his little uh, talk first, and then I'll answer some of the most frequently asked questions that I get. Hello, I'm Raji. I'm Charlie's care attendant. And like everyone was mentioning, on certain days I have a, I have a second job in the summertime. This, working with Charlie is can be flexible, but also I enjoy working with Charlie sometimes more than working my other jobs. <laughs> so, as you can see, Charlie's actually his joy will be around. He has lots of energy. He's a teenager. And some tasks that we do around the house that he really gets enthusiastic with is walking his dog Cookie Bear. We do household things like doing dishes. He does things himself. Sometimes we pick up the trash. We go out. We go shopping. He asks me how much this is. How can we get it? Time to go to pay for it. He's doing tasks. He's picking up some information himself. And he talks to me about his school his interests. We do go to the movies. He uh, likes to watch what he can online. He likes to sing. He likes to... He has a lot of interest, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> As for myself, my experiences with Consumer Direct, it's... I, before this job, I used to have... I used to be a receptionist. I used to work with construction. I used to be a cashier. This is pretty much the longest job I have uh, was able to hold with no background in it, but I've learned on the job, and whatever questions I had, Kimberly was more than open to talk about it or to help me, and same with Charlie. He was always uh, willing to help me out with that information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when Raji first started working for us, he kept saying, are you sure this is a real job? Are you sure this is a real job? Because we are very active. Uh, Charlie loves to go to shows at uh, his sister's. We have an older daughter who um, is f five years older. So she was in drama all through high school. So Raji got to the point where he could take Charlie alone and they could just go off to the show. Um, and Charlie is one that will watch the show every single night that they perform. And uh, I think this summer his, he hit a record. He watched, uh, he went to see Incredibles 2 um, eight times with different caregivers. Um, we have about 10 different people that come in and out of our home every week uh, because of scheduling. 
And uh, some of the biggest questions that I get, the biggest question I get is, I don't want to have strangers in my house. And um, this is this is always, I always feel like this is a tough love conversation. It's um, you get to choose which strangers are in your house, and that's that's all. That's the best thing I can say for you. To you is is you have to make a decision. Uh, do you want to keep going the way you've been going? And if you're looking at needing an attendant, you probably need an attendant. Uh, for a variety of reasons. It could be so that you could be with your other children. It could be so that you could continue working. It could be just for your own self-sanity. Um, and I see you all nodding because we've all been there. And um, I'm here to tell you it's not easy. It's not fun sometimes having people in, in your home. Yes, we've uh, had stuff stolen from us. We've had insurance claims brought against us. Um, we've had people, you know, lie and and, and do things that they're not supposed to do as far as medically, giving him the wrong shots in the wrong place. And that all has happened, and we've survived it all. Um, we learned to lock up valuables. I learned to not care about my grandmother's table, which was completely destroyed <laughs> over time. Um, you know, it was a precious uh, heirloom to me, but it's not as precious as he is, and it wasn't as precious as the time I got to spend with our daughter. Um, Charlie's care and management is overwhelming, as well as the fact that both his father and I work, um, and we've worked through all 15 years, um, and we're still, like, sane <laughs> sitting here in front of you. I can't say that I'm terribly healthy because my health has taken a hit uh, because it's been a long 15 years and a lot, a lot of stress. Um, my favorite was the doctor saying to me, you need to reduce your stress. And I had just told them about our life. He goes, you have to reduce it. And I'm like, what do you want me to do? And so I have had to take some hard steps. One of them was getting people in my home. Um, so it's not easy, but it's doable. You have to be smart. You have to choose the right person. Go with your gut. And if you're not a good gut person to figure out if somebody's a liar or a cheater or a stealer or a pedophile or whatever, get somebody to interview with you who is. Um, I never interviewed, well, let's put it this way. I never had a successful uh, hire when I didn't have my daughter. She would sit in the other room and listen and watch, and then she would give me yay or nay. And if I followed her yays, I was okay. When I didn't, I always was wrong and I paid the price. She was extremely talented at it for an 11, 10, 12, 15, 18-year-old. She's amazing. And my husband, not so good. He likes everybody. Um, so I found out quickly he wasn't there. This one, um, we very quickly incorporated into the process of the interview. Oh, I meant to tell you, the, the consumer directed guide that you have um, or that you can download, my entire story, word for word, how I interview someone, the ads that I place, the interview sent script that I use is in that. Um, so I'm not going to spend time going over that word for word because it's already there. But Charlie plays a very a strong part in the hire. For instance, he would greet them at the door, and I can see immediately how they greet him as to whether or not they're going to work. I shake their hand, and I can tell immediately if they're going to work for our family or if I have a couple questions, uh, or if absolutely not. You know, and they walk in the door and they reek of smoke. I know it's not going to work for us, um, just because that's who we are as a family, and those are some priorities that we have. And sometimes it really hurts to send that potential out the door, but I've never uh, regretted it. Uh, the people we have had come through our lives are incredible incredible gifts and blessings. I just, yesterday, a nurse that we've had now for about a year told us that she's moving to California. And I, I cried. I always cry. And then I say, I'm not going to say goodbye because we don't. Um, most everyone who works in our home becomes a dear family friend because they work for Charlie for a long time. And if they don't work for Charlie and us for a long time, it's good riddance. Um, I had one guy, just a funny story, Charlie has a, a beloved animal that has gone in many surgeries with him and many trips to many hospitals uh, named Woo Woo, he's a little stuffed dog, Woo Woo, for Wolf Wolf. 
And uh, one time they took a trip, the Ada and Charlie took a trip to Kmart, and Lulu was left at Kmart. And the aide was standing in my living room telling me that, you know, he left Lulu at the Kmart. And I just looked at him and said, what are you still standing here for? I have Charlie. Go find Lulu. And he's like, what? I said, go to Kmart and get the dog back. And so he did. Uh, and he was no longer in our employ. And <laughs> there are certain things that have a high priority. And <laughs> Lulu and Charlie's safety is one. So I don't want to have strangers in my house. They're only strangers until they come in your house, and then they can become beloved, beloved blessings and friends. But that's up to you and your attitude. If you continue to think of them as strangers in your house, you're, you will feel that pain. Uh, what if they steal things? If they're good friends, they won't. Um, if they're not, they will. Lock your stuff up. Okay. Don't tempt anybody. Um, how do I know who would make a good caregiver? Again, in the caregiver guide, I have a great list of things that I look for and questions I ask and specific things that I want. Like I want people who are young. Charlie doesn't get to go to a lot of school because of his medical history. Um, so I wanted people who could be his friend. I don't necessarily want grandma, although for some people, grandma is the best caregiver ever because she's already there. She's taking. She's not going to steal your stuff, or maybe she will. But you know, um, she and you can pay her and make it official. Um, we didn't have any family close by to uh, to do that with, um, so we did AIDS. Um, so how do I know who would make a good caregiver? You choose. You set up the parameters and you choose. And you ask the hard questions. Um, why? And then the question that I get all the time is that it's just easier to do it myself. And yes, it is. But if you want to live sane and healthy, or healthy, kind of healthy, <laughs> the long haul, the long haul, you can't. You have to have help. And it's a hard bullet to swallow, especially for someone like me, and I imagine many of you because you're sitting here, um, because we know we can do it all. You know, I'm a great mother. I'm a great. I can. I'm a firstborn out of six kids. I can do anything, and I can do it well. Well, I couldn't do this, and my and my the sneaky health um, toll that my body has paid, and I'm now trying to deal with is phenomenal and um, real. You can't just wish it away. Um, you have to take care of yourself. And I've been there, and I know people say you have to put yourself first, and uh, it, you, sometimes you can't. So you have to take care of yourself other ways. And having a person in your home to help can be the greatest blessing in the world. I <laughs> adore Raji. We actually knew Raji for years before because he worked at the Ark. Um, as a receptionist, and, and Nancy, a friend of mine, had said, you should hire Raji, and I was like, no, no. Raji, even out of all my nurses, is the most attentive to the details of when he starts getting sick. Uh, he notices them first. Um, another big question I get is, AIDS are not supposed to feed G-tubes or take care of ileostomies or all that kind of medical stuff. And we got a special, we developed a training with our pediatrician, and she wrote into Medicaid, and so we have a special dispensation so that Raji can feed him, but it must be under my supervision. So whenever Raji's there, I'm there, um, for the most part, except like if I go to the store for an hour or whatever. And uh, um, so I work from home during the time that Raji I want to tell you about these pictures. Thank you, Charlie, for reminding me. Um, you see that we, we counted the three years uh, of the Halloween because that is the first one. That's uh, actually no. The second one is uh, is the back side of the arrow, and that is my daughter Sophia, and that is Charlie dressed as Raji <laughs> <laughs> because Raji could not take him trick or treating. Oh. So then last year was the beast, 
and then this year was incredible. And uh, I, I just can't tell you how great it is to have my son have a friend. Um, and even though it's mismatched, oh well, you know, life happens. And this is all life. So um, it's hard. It's challenging. I still work very hard at the whole process with PPL and the service facilitators who come, and they're not really that much help, although Lucy says they are. They're really not. Um, I offer you, you can call the ARC at any time and get hold of me if you have questions. Um, I encourage you to read the script and the whole scenario I wrote about how I hire people because I've hired a good maybe 30 different uh, attendants over the last, I don't know, seven or eight years. Uh, and then we've had nurses coming in and out of our house. We've had over 100. Um, I highly recommend Consumer Directed over agency because uh, agency you don't get to choose. And also, the same amount of money goes towards an attendant. And if you have an agency, they're taking some of it off the top. So the, you get what you pay for kind of deal. You can get some real gems, but they're few and far between. And then I'll, I'll wait for other questions, but we'll, pat, we'll let you guys talk. Let's get some questions. I'll have okay, uh, Hillary go next, and then we'll reveal our secret weapon here at the end as our, as our wrap up today. <laughs> no pressure on Donna. <laughs> Uh, my name is Hilary Dykeman, and I'm a support coordinator here at the Arts of Northern Virginia. I've been here for about four years now. Um, most of that time, I was doing case management and service facilitation until about a year ago. We just continued uh, service facilitation services, and we just do case management. Um, so we have a couple of service facilitator agencies that we work with. But I'm here today to kind of tell you um, what I've seen, like who's been successful, who's not, and I can just kind of share about those kinds of experiences I've had for my caseload of 23. Um, and I would say probably about a little over half of those 23 have consumer directed care. Um, so for the successful um, people, I would say like those people have that have found really great attendance, like Raji, um, have really like thought outside of the box um, rather than, I guess, thinking inside of the box. Um, like for example, um, I've got one family. I was taking them on a tour of a day support program uh, for their son, and while we were touring, the mom just said to me, "Well, there's a gentleman that's working there that looks like like." totally matches the profile of what they're looking for. Um, and at first I was a little uncomfortable with that, but we asked the day program if we could ask that staff, because a lot of times those staff at the day programs, um, if any of your families go to it, like a day program, supported employment uh, service, um, they also do consumer-directed care, like after hours when they're not at the day program. So that day program was fine with us asking, and we asked him. Um, it felt a little awkward doing that, um, being that he didn't know us at all. Mm -hmm. But um, he actually ended up emailing us back, and uh, he ended up working with this family for probably about two years. And it was a good fit. The individual was very comfortable with the person, um, plus he had experience working with people with disabilities because of his job. Um, so that was like a really cool um, way to find someone that was very uh, unique. Um, I guess for being like unsuccessful, I'd say like relying on your service facilitator to find you an attendant, they're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to be the one to be proactive. Um, ask family, friends, I would say most of the individuals on my caseload actually do have their family members doing the hours. Um, if they're over 18, that should be okay. Um, it's not ideal for everyone. If the family member's over 18. Just oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, oh, yeah, the family member and the individual, right? The individual can have like an adult sibling. So, for example, if a 16-year-old wanted their 18-year-old brother to be their care attendant, that would be possible. Oh, okay. 
Well, yeah. So uh, what I guess what I meant was a parent. So um, if the individual is 18 years old, then their parents could provide the care. Um, <laughs> it's not ideal because a lot of times, you know, that means you don't have to work. But I'm just saying, don't let the work. <laughs> um, yeah, honestly, a lot of the adults on my case, the parents are doing it um, because of these challenges. Um, but yeah, a lot of families um, that don't have, that aren't doing it themselves, they'll ask people they work with, um, the people they work with, kids. Um, if they go to a church, um, do you just have to really use the people that you know um, in any way? Uh, like what Lucy said, if they go to like an art class, if there's somebody else there, um, just like any way that you can think of um, other than relying on someone else to do it, because you really have to be the one to do it. Got a question just for clarification. So I have two children on the spectrum. So we do have uh, an, one attendant. Um, um, but you said if a parent, because um, they also have a lot of appointments during the day, so mm -hmm. it's hard for me to have a full-time job because there's appointments every day, or you know, ABA or speech or OT or something going on. So um, only time a parent can be the caregiver is only if the child is 18 years and over, is that correct? Or correct. And there's some other stipulate. I mean, you have to show that you've made efforts at trying other kinds of services, you've been unsuccessful, this person has unique needs that can't be met by your average caregiver, those kinds of things. I mean, to Kimberly's point in the beginning, of course, it opens you right back up to the burnout you're trying yeah. to avoid by having help. But um, for some people, it ends up being a little bit of a stopgap. Yeah. Oh yeah, one thing I want to add as you were talking is I remember a story from a family that I worked with which always seemed brilliant to me. Um, it was a community in like the, um, the Springfield, Lincolnia, Franconia area and um, the mom put an ad out in her neighborhood listserv because a common uh, request is someone to help in the mornings, right? Mornings are super hectic and stressful, but the reality is you're not going to get someone to commute from Woodbridge to work a two-hour shift in Fairfax, right, in the mornings before school starts or an hour. Um, and so families were rarely successful in finding somebody. Um, but this mom put it out on her neighborhood listserv and said, like, this isn't going to be a full-time job if you're someone who's willing to, like, walk across our condo parking lot and work for an hour or two in the mornings. And on the days you can't do it, that's okay because I'm here. It's helped for me. They were able to get someone who had no interest in evening or weekend hours or a whole lot of hours, but it was a way to get, like, a little bit of income. And for that really short shift, it was essentially the only way to fill it. Um, so I just think that's another example of, like, looking right in your own community and so many communities now have Nextdoor, which is that online listserv or neighborhood Facebook pages or all those kinds of things, and it's a great place to ask for people again, especially for those short shifts, someone who may be willing to do the job who never would have been looking for this in the first place, but a short shift, two houses down, you know, someone else takes care of all the payroll, cool. For some people, that's a really good fit. Just remind me of that. Mm -hmm. it has to be at least 18, correct? It can be like a yes. high schooler. Yes, it has to be 18. They can be an age of a high schooler, but yes, <laughs> it has to be 18. Mm -hmm has to be 18. And that just made me think of it too. Um, I think I've had families that um, their child has graduated high school and there's some people um, or some other students at that high school that they were friends with, um, they, that they got along real well with, um, they ended up hiring them as staff. Um, another person uh, who was like a staff, I guess that they're the individual's Taekwondo class. Um, they were successful with that because they already knew the person. Some of the neatest stories I heard were about parents hiring someone like sim from classes, from someone known around um, who didn't necessarily have a whole lot of experience. And then the tremendous benefit was then the peer modeling aspect especially for my friends on the spectrum who ended up having a similar aged peer who was a care attendant. Um, they may not have been someone who was super skilled in all the kinds of, you know, like ABA or all those kinds of things, but they were someone who was getting a driver's license and paying bills and applying for college and doing all kinds of things in their life that they were talking about and doing in front of this person because it was what was going on with them. And that for many people, especially teenagers and 20-year-olds, is very different than hearing your mom say, 
apply for college. Get this done. Clean your room, right? Someone who has their own apartment for the first time is saying, yeah, man, like, I got to go clean my room. Like, this is my place. Uh, it's very different to have that modeled from you and from a friend perspective than it is to take it from someone else, which I would say is another tremendous benefit of hiring someone who may not necessarily have a lot of background in the field, but similar age, similar, similar interest kind of thing. Um, and those are usually the people you find just through life, not in an ad online. Yeah. And then I guess uh, one other thing that Kimberly kind of mentioned is like not being too, I want to say picky, but like, you know, being willing to go for someone that you wouldn't have necessarily thought of at first, um, even if they don't necessarily meet all of those qualifications, um, sometimes you'll be surprised that someone that you didn't think would work out actually works out really well. Um, my son is uh, in the IG winter. He has an um, ARMCSD and he has a computer printer. Mm -hmm. So if I would mind uh, ask to be my um, case manager, is that okay? Or what, um, is role, what is the role between the case manager and the CSD? And yeah, the you computer? should have a choice. And this is where I'm like, not 100% sure. I know for the DD waiver, um, what's known now as the FIS, Family and Individual Support Waiver, that's what we do primarily. But some of us do have the ID waiver um, on our caseload. Not it's really sure. tricky. So effectively, the community services boards have said, if your IQ is 70 or lower, your only case manager can be a community services board. So if you didn't want the Fairfax Community Services Board, for example, you could ask the Alexandria or the Arlington Community Services Board to support you. The CSBs have said if your IQ is 71 or higher, you have the choice of a community services board as well as a private agency like the ARC of Northern Virginia. So that's the one part of our whole redesign system post-2016 when our waivers got all um, revamped that is still IQ dependent. So unfortunately, Ben, it's... Yes. Mm. I, I would highly recommend pushing at that because if you want to have the ARC to be your case manager, you should have the ARC be your case manager. Oh, yes, to be clear, that's not like a law. That's not in the Constitution. Else, <laughs> right? Like that's something that could theoretically be changed, but that's just I the think it's something now. that kind of got grandfathered. They quite didn't know what to do with it, so that's where they put it kind of deal, or it was easier for them to divide up the, the workload. But if you want, an, you know, if you want a case manager, but was your question about that, or did you question about an aunt being a, a support worker? Um, my question was, if I push to request a case manager, it's off, uh, case manager. So what is the role between the case manager and the CSP and facilitator? The CSP pays the ARC case managers. Yeah, so pr we primarily do um, the FIS waiver, which is known as the DD waiver for those with the 71 and above. Um, there are a few exceptions, but it's a really long story how they got it. Yeah, and, and it's not an exception that can be made again. So yeah, it's not really worth so it. unfortunately, I guess the answer would be at this time, unless we can advocate for it, um, we're just doing FIS waivers. It's because of the ID then. Yeah, it's yeah. The, the IQ, so not the type of waiver that's the driver. Yeah. Going back to the parent and being a parent, I was uh, told that some family members are not allowed to have sex when the parents become an attendant. And then some people would, the rest of were taken from the CSC people. Uh, or, mm -hmm. So what is, you know, uh, I can get the rest of it back because if yeah. I hire someone else, not parent, the attendant, I could be able to get the rest of it out. Yeah, every person should have $400 yeah. hours. Yeah, just to provide relief. Yeah, so I actually want to talk about this a little bit um, in some more detail. So anyone who has any kind of waiver, period, has a set number of support hours per week, right? That's what we talked about. You work with your team. You talk about your schedule and your needs. You come up with your set number of hours per week. 
no matter what that number is, on top of it, you have 480 hours per year, and that number is the same for anybody with any waiver, of respite services. So that's your additional fill in holes here, you know, parents are out of town here, going on a date night here, school's on break here, I need some additional supports above and beyond my usual schedule kind of hours. Um, the person who provides the personal attendant care is often the person who also provides the respite care, right? It's just noting it differently on a timesheet. The service itself looks exactly the same. It's just a separate pool of hours that you can use here and there to fill in some other shifts and other kinds of times when you may need someone. Um, in terms of the question about if a parent is a caregiver, a paid caregiver under the waiver program because the child is over 18, they haven't been able to locate anybody else, they jump through all those hoops, they should not lose respite period. And this was a big decision that came out of the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services like about 18 months or two years ago. Um, but it was relatively new and I don't know that there's been a tremendous amount of education around that. So it is not unusual to hear from someone who says we lost our respite hours because respite had historically been interpreted as relief for the unpaid caregiver. And the argument was, well, if you're paying the caregiver, you're paying the parent, why are we giving you respite hours? But the new regulations on respite are written differently. It says it's usually relief for the unpaid caregiver. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just because other things are going on. So um, going back to your support coordinator and just saying exactly that, saying like, my understanding is this is different. Please talk to your supervisor. And um, if anybody needs wording, you can email the ARC of Northern Virginia, and I can email you the wording that the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services sent to us. But there's, there's no magic in that. It's really just saying, like, I understand that this has changed. I want to make sure that we can recoup those respite hours. And that's regardless of family being the paid care attendant, sibling, anybody. No one should be losing respite um, because someone in the family is providing the regular care attendant services. Before we go into more questions, I want to go on to Donna as our panelist, and then we have questions at the end. If you have a question of clarification, that's a little bit different. Like if you say, like, what did you just say? Can you help repeat that, that kind of thing? But anything substantive will hold. So um, I'm so excited to have Donna here. And I just, as a brief aside, when we were talking, Donna immediately came to mind when we were doing this because Donna wears a lot of different hats. Uh, <laughs> in the world, in our community, in her family's life, in many, many ways. Um, and she sees this from a lot of different angles, and she'll be talking about this. Um, but as with all things that we talk about here at the ARC, we go out to give information knowing that sometimes when you leave, you feel like you've been hit with a ton of bricks, right? Like, great, so now I have all these answers. Who on earth is going to help me with all this? So Donna's part question, part answer, part okay. enigma, riddle, magic, miracle worker, That's person, wow. amazingness. I thought I was just going to hang out and look. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so hi, so I'm Donna, and um, this is when I get to do my um, hair club speech because I'm not just the president of Bark. I'm a user, and I'm a mom, and I'm a consumer-directed fan. So um, Spark is a very unique uh, daytime clubhouse model for adults after high school graduation. Okay, so that's us in a nutshell. We operate in community. And the reason that Spark is unique and the reason that it works is because um, we feel that with the right support, um, opportunities in the community are endless. It doesn't matter if you want to, you know, we've talked about a lot of things, go to the movies, go to art classes, be on a job site and need the actual support to do your job, go out on a date, have uh, your own apartment, wherever we're going on the continuum of time, you need the right support. And I love that word support and support equals people, and that's just the bottom line. It's not, you know, we can do a lot about accessible and affordable housing, we can talk about transportation, we can talk about all these things. And so with the right people in your life, you, you can have a life, like the ARC says, a life like yours. Um, I have a daughter, my husband and I have one daughter, and we say we have one child, but it's like having three. Mm -hmm. And Kristen is 27 now, and I did not uh, have a personal support attendant. That's the way we refer to um, support folks at Spark and in our world. Did not have a personal support attendant, a PSA, um, until Kristen was 21 and finishing up her last year of school. And then I thought, well, this is getting kind of crazy. We're going to bring people in. We were the family that was afraid to kind of, wow, we're going to have folks in our house. Um, just the three of us, we kind of had our groove. We knew what we were doing. Um, 
Kristen wasn't that crazy because mom and dad were tired on the weekend. <laughs> they were like, okay, we got to get up for the game. We got to do stuff. We have to entertain the 16-year-olds. But at any rate, we got to we got to just before graduation and said, let's just bring some um, a caregiver in on the weekends, and we started that process. So you know, I can echo everything that Kimberly said. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, kiss a lot of frogs, all those things. Yeah, um, but. We've had great success, great success. Um, at Spark, I started a program called PSA Match. You can imagine what that is, Personal Support Attendant Match, because when you come to look at Spark and see if this is the right place for um, your adult child um, to come and hang out with friends and learn skills towards independence, um, we do an assessment. And I can tell you 95% of the participants at Spark bring their attendant with them because they need an attendant to be fully engaged in the community and the activities we do in the community centers. So what does that mean? Um, Spark is one of the only non-Medicaid providers of daytime support. And so we're not double dipping, right? Because I don't bill Medicaid. You can use your waiver to pay for your personal support attendant. And we haven't mentioned sort of a game changer in our world at Spark, which is self-directed services money. And so for any friends out here or um, online, at the, on the webinar online, um, if you do not have your state waiver, your DD waiver, your FIS waiver, I get all these acronyms confused because I'm not a Medicaid provider, so that's not the kind of social work stuff we focus on. We call the ARC. And we like to say, spark, calling the mothership. <laughs> we, need, we need help. Um, so what, um, what we have seen in the county, uh, and, and we've brought this to Arlington County, and they are now going to be instituting self-directed services money there as well, is we're looking at the two big questions that folks would come to spark. I, you know, my adult child really wants to come to your program. They love it. Um, this is this is exactly what we're looking for. Where do we find a personal support attendant because they can't start until they have a personal support attendant? And um, how do we pay for this? And so people who are on a waiver wait list and are eligible to be on the waiver can go to the CSB. Joel Friedman is the head of self-directed services money and there is funding that is contracted directly to families while you're on the state waiver wait list. And the most powerful part of this, and what we really advocate for at Spark, is to braid services. And so if you have the CCC Plus waiver, you can also have self-directed services money. And so while you're waiting for your state waiver, that is a way to bring resources together to be able to cover the life that you're trying to build for you and your adult child. The PSA match service came about very organically because people kept saying, well, my kid wants to start, my kid wants to start, where do I find an attendant? And that's what we've all been talking about. And you're right, a, you know, a case manager and a support coordinator are not going to be the one to find, um, you know, a, a personal support attendant. So what we developed is a, is a process, and I wrote a manual, and I'm, I'm ashamed of myself, Kimberly, because I need to look at your manual, because we actually wrote it for the self-advocate to interview um, and, and, and profile what they want to do. So here's the lesson learned. My daughter was 21. I hired a fabulous woman. Her name is Radia. She's still with us today. Um, they love each other very much. It wasn't a smooth start. I hired Radia. See where I'm going with that? I hired Radia. She's my age, and I thought I was supposed to replace me. Bad move. That was not right. We have four other attendants in Kristen's life. They are like her sisters. She hired those people. So Kristen hired the attendants who are 27, 28, 29 years old. When we look for an attendant, yes, um, they are young and they typically have a trajectory. They're trying to do other, other things. But I have to tell you, looking um, back over the years, just like Kimberly said, these people become part of your family. So I have now not one child, not one daughter. I have you know, five daughters. It's fantastic. They're all coming for Thanksgiving. Can't wait to see who wants to help Kristen eat turkey and stuffing, because they'll all be standing there looking at each other going, she needs that, she needs that. Um, they're wonderful. So PSA matches Spark. Kristen and Chris and I have, you know, our world. I call it Kristen Incorporated. 
Um, I have set things up like I do a business at Spark. I have a team captain in my home, and they are the ones that, you know, you pay that, you know, dollar or two more um, to, to do extra things. Um, Self-directed services money. And see, I just said that, and there's probably a lot of waiver people looking at me. Probably there's case managers running out of their cubicles going, don't talk about paying people. Mm -hmm. So self-directed services money has a ceiling cap of up to $20 an hour to pay for a person's assignment. So as you know right now, way, way better than waiver rates. Um, so in our world, because Kristen has been on the state waiver wait list for about 12 years now, um, self-directed services money has been a game changer for us. So I can have a team captain that makes a couple dollars more an hour and handles all of her medications, um, make sure that, you know, doctor's appointments are done, the van is serviced, her, you know, she's getting her appointments to the way in the wheelchair guy and just all of those little administrative things and that's what I need to do so that I can work full time. So you get to kind of set up your corporation, you know, the way that works for you. Um, PSA match, um, just like I'm, I, I really do have to say that I am the bearer of, of crummy news a lot um, in the community because there's not one bucket of money to pay for everything and families are going to have to pay for some, you know, some portion of your adult child's life. Plan for it as early as you can. Um, the money that we have from the county and CCC Plus, I would say covers like 85% of Kristen's you know, costs of, of things, you know, for her. Um, but, you know, if we're gonna, if we're gonna need some, some extra help, it's, um, you know, it's, it's gonna come out of our pocket and that's, that's the way that game works for us. We go into the movies, we're paying for the attendant to go to the movies. Self-directed services money accounts for much of that, so if it's available to you, um, I would suggest you look at it. The reason I say that is PSA match is a fee. Is a, is a private pay fee, and Spark is a club. So it's just like going to Gold's Gym or Lifetime Fitness. It's a club. My guys run their club, and we're not a Medicaid provider. Self-directed services money can pay for the Spark fee, and people who have the waiver who come to Spark use SSI money or private funds to pay the monthly fee, just like you would pay the monthly fee to go to a gym. It's like a gym membership. So we have a couple of services. We have a basic, a basic coaching service where we come out and meet with the family and meet with a self-advocate and find out what it is you're looking for, the, the nitty-gritty, you know, hours and how much you want to pay and, you know, what, what kinds of responsibilities, you know, you're looking for. Some families are very, very clear, you know, it must be a female or it must be a male, you know, that kind of stuff. So we do a profile. And then we advertise for you screen things based on your profile and give you some resumes to then make your phone calls, make your interview appointments, and off you go. We're not, we're not an agency to, like, they're not our employees. We don't do anything except help you screen and filter based on what you've said you're looking for. That's our basic coaching service. The next coaching service we call is enhanced coaching, and um, that's when we would give you a couple of resumes and then you say, well, I think I'd like to meet this person. You call them and you make an appointment to meet that applicant at a Starbucks or Pete's, don't want to be like, you know, just out <laughs> Starbucks. You meet it or in a public caribou. place. Coffee, caribou. Coffee. <laughs> I don't drink coffee. It's just terrible how many coffee houses I go to. Um, but, but our consultant will come out and meet and do the interview with the self-advocate and the family member. That's, that's the one, um, that's the other part. And then, then the premium services is, um, you know, really doing the one-on-one the -on -one interview and going through the whole, the whole process with you. So we have it all in a manual and it's very reasonable. Um, and it's been, we have a terrific success, um, a lot, a, a great track record. We've not, we've not had anybody come back to us and say this wasn't a good fit. So I think what, what you're hearing, the bright red thread that's running through here is you're looking for a person that's going to fit into your life. The actual training is something that really doesn't take that long and it probably goes for a long period of time because everybody's growing and changing and doing things and so you want somebody who's going to grow and change and, and, and do things with your adult child or you as a self-advocate. You don't want to do the same thing every day. So we found this to be something that really gave people a lot of freedom. Um, it's something that's really helped uh, us in our life and I have to say having Kristen out in the community doing what she wants, you kind of smile. My husband and I smile. I, 
you know, Kristen is somebody who has very high support needs. Okay, so she's nonverbal. She is intellectually disabled. She is quadriplegic. She um, is blind, and and she has some, some medical issues as well. And she's thriving. She has a van and a credit card and really cool kids to hang out with. Mm -hmm. She's just living the dream of a 27-year-old. She goes to Spark four days a week. She has errands and jobs that she has to do on Fridays. She gets to kind of pick and choose what she wants to do on Saturdays. She's meeting people and going to the movies. And I have to tell you that seven years ago, my daughter had never gone into a movie theater. She could not handle it. So what life has been like um, since she's graduated and you know, gone out of school and the things that she's doing in a community center because, boy, it's loud and we share. And she's an only child, so all of that has been, wow, disrupt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But she's, but she's thriving, and so are the other 50 uh, friends that I have at Spark. So we're about building teams. So with that, I'm just going to say uh, thanks for having me here, and let's hear if you guys have some questions or if people are on the Yeah, so real quick before you do that, one of the stories that taught me a lot about personal care attendance was I was visiting one of the Spark clubhouses one day, and uh, there was a personal support attendant who was there who was an actress, and she said, I'm working on this piece that I'm going to be auditioning for this weekend. And as Donna mentioned, Spark um, exists inside of Clubhouse, or in a Clubhouse model inside a community center. So there was a piano inside the community center because they were in a community center, right? So she plays this song, and she's singing, and she's, like, engaging the people around the room. Like, and she's talking, and I'm saying to Donna, like, who on earth is this PSA? Like, she is amazing. And Donna says, like, she wasn't always. Right? It was being around other PSAs in the SPARC model, seeing good caregivers in action that helped. So whether or not you're going to SPARC, the idea of seeing your caregiver see you provide really good care or family or friends provide really good care or going out with your child with a disability and their friends with disabilities and them all bringing their personal support assistance with them, that rising tide has the potential to lift all boats and everybody seeing like anyone, right, when you see someone else doing something well and having success, you want to try and replicate that. And giving everybody learns differently. But that kind of learning by watching other people doing successfully is very powerful. And that idea really stuck with and me. Our, PSA, our PSAs ask each other a lot of questions. And I think that I know that, mm -hmm. that what I've done over the last 13 years is sticking because when we close um, for winter break or spring break, um, or we're you know Veterans Day because community centers are closed on these mm -hmm. federal holidays and gosh I love the children but when Fairfax County Public Schools are out um, we lose a lot of our community center space too mm -hmm. so we are now in the four corners of the county today because we've lost one of our clubhouses because SAC is uh, is, is, is in our space um, but I think that when I see everybody making their own plans and the PSAs being friends, coming from the same country, sharing their, their cultural food, having a place where they feel good. And we've, we've been training, right? We go to the mall, we go bowling, we, go, you know, we, we teach all kinds of life skill stuff. And they find friends. Um, you know, it just, it's, it's been a ripple kind of thing. But I do hear um, all of my guys, we ask them all the time. We actually track data on how many, you know, how many things that you do out in the community outside of Spark. And it's pretty interesting to see how many friends will say, oh, well, I like bowling. Well, you like going to the movies. I don't feel like going to the movies. I want to go bowling. And a group will go bowling, and a group will go to the movies, and the PSAs are really comfortable doing that now because they've been doing it with us for years. So that's, that's the upside of that. So let's see if anybody... Oh, real quick. I wanted to address some things that had come in through the chat online, um, both questions and things that I wanted to clarify. So one was, and this is a great question, can a person use both consumer and agency-directed services? Yes, not simultaneously, right? Like you wouldn't have a consumer-directed attendant and an agency-directed person at the house at the same moment. But a lot of families do something to the tune of, you know, we work Monday through Friday. We can't be home till 8 p.m. Come heck or high water, someone's got to be here from 3 when the bus shows up till 8 p.m. And I can't deal with anybody calling out. I'm going to have an agency staff it. But on the weekends or 8 to 10 p.m. or whatever it is, on hours when we're more comfortable being the own backup, if our consumer-directed person calls out and we don't have a fleet of 50 people who to fill that back up, we want to do that. So you can pair them in any way you want, so long as the schedule makes sense. Generally speaking, agencies don't like staffing shifts less than about four-hour blocks each. 
it's hard for them to hire people again who can do that commute and the paperwork and make it worth it no more so than most people want to work a shift less than four hours. Um, there are exceptions to that. But generally, yes, 100% you can have both. Um, it's just a matter of kind of working with your team to figure out what those would look like. So other questions of clarification here. Can the parent who is a legal guardian of an adult child be an attendant? So this question got significantly more complicated in the last 60 days. <laughs> Yes-ish. So if you are the guardian of your adult child who is over 21 years of age, universally, yes, you can be the paid care attendant. If you are the parent of an adult child between 18 and the day before they tw turn 21, you m may not be able to be the paid care attendant if you are the legal guardian. And that's because of a change that's going on with Virginia Medicaid at a much larger level. Virginia's both DD waivers did this last year, and all the CCC plus, that old EDCD waiver, made this move in September, which is why I say this move is like very, very fresh. Now, if you're under 21 and you're using one of those sets of waivers, instead of using your waiver to get your personal care attendant, you're using this Medicaid backdoor program called EPSDT. And we've got webinars and toolkits and all kinds of things on it. I'm not going into it in tremendous detail because I think it's its own exhausting thing. My point is, if you have started to hear that you're using EPSDT, you're using EPSDT for your personal care, the EPSDT manual is different than the waiver manual, and the EPSDT manual explicitly prohibits guardians, parent guardians, from being the paid care attendant. But EPSDT ends once someone's 21. So this only ever affects people between 18 when they're allowed to have a parent as a paid caregiver in some cases, and 21 when every single person ages out of EPSDT. So in that brief window, that's why I say the answer is yes-ish. And this is kind of new and tricky. Um, I recognize this is why we record it. Go back and listen to that a time or two again, right? Like we'll think through that as an interesting thought experiment, but that's something that's very new and fresh. Um, so there were a few questions here about self-directed services and asked for clarifications about limits on self-directed services and waiting for self-directed services and all those kinds of things. Self-directed services is its own beast. And we have, um, again, like whole workshops on our YouTube channel and whole resource guides devoted to self-directed services and all kinds of things. Donna was more mentioning it kind of in the context of the personal care attendant matching and all those sorts of things mm -hmm. um, and finding people on some things just have to kind of keep in the back of your mind. But I would say kind of going into the details of that or beyond what we want to do today here. Isn't it only Fairfax and maybe now Arlington? Yes. Yeah, so it's only like, so it's, yeah. very, it's, it's limited very in a lot of ways. Very local. Um, mm -hmm. So like that's, that's not something that's going to be tremendously applicable to everybody here, but it's a great resource if it does apply to you. So I, as I do my follow-up email, we'll send a link to some of those presentations on self-directed services and some of the more information out of it for people who want to learn more about that option. So, so um, self-directed services money is really utilized when you're out in the community. So it's not the same as having a waiver person in your mm -hmm. home um, doing, you know, personal care. Like your self-directed person isn't the person that comes and helps you do your shower in the evening and that kind of stuff. It's really about community-based support. Um, it's a game changer for Spark because guess what? We're in the community all day, every day. So. Anybody have anything else here they want to talk about? Yeah, so that, uh, I, again, webinar folks, keep chatting in your questions, and I will read them here in the room, but we'll go to folks in the room here to see if they have questions, and we'll start down here. Earlier you mentioned that the pay care was the same. Is it coming from Medicaid as the agency, only the people for the agency a little bit less because the agency is taking as far off the top? Well, I'm one of the people that have both. I do the okay. consumer directed and the agency directed, and the agency is telling me that they're giving them like $16 an hour, and I'm like, how are you doing that? Because the will pay 11 something an hour, oh, plus. 11.97, that's 11.93, I think we found out it was. So how are you paying your people $16? Where are you getting that $16 from? Because mm -hmm. so it depends on the service. So some things from agencies can look kind of similar but are different. There's a service through the waiver called in-home services that's done through an agency. And in-home services are focused on specific skill building. So that person would be like writing goals, charting someone's progress on that goal. So like it's a, it's a more intensive kind of service than I am here to take care of you. Maybe we'll go out and do some things together, right? That service has a higher rate of reimbursement because you're asking the person to do more, right? So you have to work with an agency that specifically offers in-home services, and those in-home care attendants usually are paid something in the like mid-teens-ish 
kind of area after the agency takes their cut. Again, it's a different service. For personal care attendant, like you, the exact equivalent to a consumer directed care attendant, um, an agency is paid, and I'll have to look up the waiver rates. So, like, someone feel free to like shoot me in the foot here and chat it in if you would like. Uh, but they're paid something like 16 ish, 17 ish dollars an hour, but the agency then has to hire an HR director and a director and a hiring person and they have to have paperwork and they have to have an office building and fax lines and phone lines and all that kind of overhead thing, which is why Kimberly says by the time they take all that off the top, generally speaking, agency directed care attendants are earning less than the eleven ninety three that a consumer directed care attendant does because the agency has taken a big chunk out of that seventeen ish dollars an hour, I can't remember the exact number, that they're reimbursed to cover all of their overhead because they've got to provide backup staff and all this hiring and all this kinds of business. It is up to the discretion of that agency to figure all of that out. So if you go to John Smith's Home Care Agency and Sally Smith's Home Care Agency, they may not pay people exactly the same. They may take a different chunk out of overhead. It seems to me like this agency is taking very, very little to nothing out of overhead. And if they can operate that way, well, that is just stellar. Uh, I'm pretty comfortable with math, and I can't make that work, but um, to be honest, yeah. it would worry me because it doesn't add up. Um, and so they're either possibly uh, billing incorrectly, like billing for a higher service and just giving you a PC, PSA, or they're, you know, they have rich investors who, you know, chunk money in and they can spend it as well, I'd like to give all options because I'm being recorded. <laughs> but yeah, that would worry me uh, a great deal. I have found that they don't like talk, talking about it, so I'm surprised you even found out. But yeah. So um, I would definitely look into that or make your decision. Um, it's not going to come back on you because it is agency directed, but it could be messy and you could lose your purse. Yeah, yeah it would worry me. A little bit. So, so the other piece of, of this um, braiding services stuff, I think I was mentioning that you know we in our home have the CCC Plus waiver and we have self-directed. And so a portion of Kristen's day is out in the community and a portion of her day is at home. And so the EDCD, or I'm sorry, the CCC Plus um, attendant is the one who is at home. And the um, funds that we use with self-directed are the people who take Kristen to Spark and to the mall and to the movies and to bowling and to church and to anything else. So that's 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 what we mean at Spark about grading services. It's just like you guys are talking about self direct I'm sorry, consumer directed and agency directed. There's other ways to do it if you don't have your waiver and uh, your state waiver. I can't and you don't have a waiver. And all <laughs> please. Mm -hmm. And all of the um, answers are, you know, at the C S B with, with the self directed services um, department. So you can kind of find it out. But it's been it's been very um, it's been very useful, impacting, game, you know, really good for many of my families. So we have about 50 families in the Spark program right now, and I would say that we're probably over half, if not, if not close to, to two thirds of our our families using self directed. So that, but they're coming out into the community doing Spark, so that's why it works. I will tell you that when you manage the care of your loved one well, you don't get your waiver right away because they know it, and they know that you will survive a little longer, and they have people who, um, just a minute, they have people who uh, the parents are dying and they've never made any plans and they're not on any list that are coming in because the parents are dead and they don't have any place to put that person, so they're going to get the waiver before you because you can survive another day. Charlie is very anxious to read his speech again. Would anyone oh, please. if we did that? All right, you're up, bud. All right. Hello, my name is Charlie Stillers. I have fun with Raji. We go to the store and 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 movies and and movies. Okay. Um, we. Watch my dog, Cookie Bear. Raji is my friend. Thank you. Right, buddy. Questions for Charlie? 
I will say he's only practiced that about six times as of yesterday and today, so I'm pretty impressed. Any questions for Charlie? Charlie has a question, Mike. Charlie. Hello. So what is your favorite activity to do with Raji? So the oh. question for those on the webinar is, what's Charlie's favorite thing to do with Raji? Oh, um, um, Raji, um, um, my friend, um, takes care of my dog, too. They're fine and good. He takes care of his dog, and they're fine and good. Um, they do walk and feed Cookie Bear and brush and, and give her baths outside in the car wash area of our condo. Mm -hmm. um, you like to go get Coke Zero, right? <coughs> they go to the store to get Coke Zero, which is Charlie's only only thing that goes by mouth. And I have to say, uh, Char uh, Raji is an enormous uh, boost to me because it turns out that Robbie, Raji's hobby is cooking. And so we like to support his hobby <laughs> and let him, you know, buy, we buy the groceries, get them delivered, everything, and he does the meal plan, and he usually sets us up for a couple of days a week with some amazing food. Yeah. That is the good side of having wonderful people in your house. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Um, besides thinking outside the box and looking for an attendant, does the majority of you go to care.com? Is there any other online source? Oh, yeah. So uh, the question, again, for folks online is besides kind of that thinking outside the box and looking creative, we, do most people go to care.com? And in my experience, yes. If you're not doing that kind of networking, finding someone that you either know or know a friend of a friend kind of thing, it's the largest resource for finding people who you haven't had any prior oh, give me a with. couple years. We'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I uh, do checks. Background checks, um, yeah. sort and filter. It's, it's, I only use uh, care.com, uh, but there's like care.com that other people use. There's Nanny, Consider City. I'm going to hand it back to people. There's Nanny and Consider Direct. There's a scan and put it in there. So, yeah, Care.com is the um, background checks are really important. We do that too. PPL does that too, right? Yeah. 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 Any other questions? Um, so, you know, with the hiring strangers and like you said, you know, so have you, you guys ever um, like recommend like the ring cameras and then? Oh, security in your home. Yeah. Security. Yes, I have videos in Charlie's room and the living room and the dining room. Uh, I can access them by my phone. We got them through Cox when we, when we moved and Cox is our new provider. They had a nice little deal, you know, that you can get. And I tell everybody that the cameras are there, and we move on from there. Um, I can look in at any time. They all know that. The nurses know that. Raji knows that. Um, yeah. And Charlie often is checking on Raji himself by coming in my room and looking at the phone and checking on Raji in the other room. So yeah, there we have we have cameras and we use them. I haven't done that yet. I I know that it's I know that a lot of friends do that, but I haven't done that yet. I recommend, uh, I recommend it if you can. Um, it gives you a nice sense of security um, because you can check in any time. Like I wake up at 3 in the morning and look at the nurse and see if they're asleep or not, you know, because they're there from 10 to 7 to see what they're doing. Do they have the light on? Is, are they messing with his sleep time, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, uh, it's not that expensive if you bundle it. We have um, we helped some friends move out into the community into their own apartments, and we have done that, Kimberly, for you know for our guys who are in their own apartment. Um, Nest is the other one that yes. I know of. Yes. Yes. And also, if you tell them and they have a problem with it, get rid of them. If you tell them that you have a camera and they have any issue whatsoever, say goodbye. It's easy. That's an easy one. From my perspective, sure, real quick, just a folks on the phone here, just kind of a clarification of the role of the CSB support coordinator, case manager, and the service facilitator. And so it comes from where they're working for and what type of services you have. So I do not have a waiver. 
a DD waiver. I have a CCC plus waiver. So I only have a service facilitator. Okay, and then there's me as the employer of record for my CD services. Okay. And yeah. For, for, for if you have a DD waiver, you have a case. What do you call it? Self support coordinator or case manager, mm -hmm. and we're responsible for linking you to all the waiver services, mm -hmm. such as consumer directed services, service location, um, supported employment, day support, home modification, all of that. No. So the service facilitator, I, know, I explain this all the time, um, but I still don't always make sense of it. Uh, the service facilitator manages the consumer-directed care. So you only have a service facilitator if you have consumer-directed attendant or consumer-directed personal or companion hours. And in that um, consumer directed care attendant guide that again everybody has access to, uh, there's a chart in there with checks on who is responsible for what and what does the service facilitator do. Think of them as your HR department. They should be processing new hire paperwork. They should be processing background checks. They should be helping to process timesheets. They should be helping to process end of the year tax paperwork. All those kinds of things. Actually, I don't know what you just said, but. For consumer directed, they are not your HR person. They are an annoying person that comes up <laughs> questions yeah. once a month. Your HR person is oh, PPL. You're right. They're they're your yeah. to PPL. Yeah, they come once a month and ask you the same thing. Right. Yeah. The That's all they do. Medication. They do they do ask for the authorization for the your your PSA hours. That's their right. job. But for my, they're the one that deny the rest of the hours. So they don't have you tell to be clear, they don't have authority to approve or deny services. Their only job is to write up authorization like requests for services and to submit them to be approved. So they can't say unless something's like against a rule or regulation and it seems like that's the issue here, so that's what I'm saying raise with them, that they have misinterpreted or been misinformed about the rule about respite. And so they are not putting forth the the request for respite, they're stopping it on the front end. That's where you need to go to them and say my understanding is that's not the situation. Please write up the request for this. Please let's submit that for authorization and, and the justification that goes along with that is what they should work with you on and kind of what those hours are going to look like and all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I hear service facilitators um, just making things all the time. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, it's not unusual. And there's a high turnover. I get a different person every yeah. I got a call from a mom this morning who yeah. said we, we were talking about the fact that PPL, like I talked about, who's been around doing this for years, is all of a sudden disappearing. And this new group is coming on board, and she says, no one seems to know about it. And I was like, well, Medicaid puts it out in a memo. Hopefully someone knows to go track it down. Hopefully someone can understand what the Medicaid memo says. And then hopefully someone trains all their staff on it. So I, I think here that UHC, that UHC is keeping PPL. Yeah, so it's the DD waivers plural, the family and individual supports the community living, the building independence waiver that are moving to this new group called Consumer Directed Care Network. Magellan, if you have Magellan and the CCC Plus waiver, you would normally say, oh, I don't have a DD waiver, I'm not affected. Magellan has moved to a new group called ACES. And this is all, again, we're doing this in November of 2018. This is all starting in January of 2019, and we haven't seen a whole lot of the rollout of that. Because we have UHC. Which managed care organization you're with? Exactly. Okay. Of course, this is a time for re enrollment. Exactly. So, now on that note, I also because now that the way they're doing the reauthorization is different. It's because of the EPSCT that you talked about before. So, the, uh, someone here in the room was asking about how the authorization for attendant hours is different. And that's true if the person using the waiver is under 21. That's that new EPSDT program that I mentioned. So if they're under 21, the way that you're getting services authorized and the regulations behind them are different as of September of this year. Which makes sense because now you have to fill out a form. Oh, oh, wait. And they you wanted it to make sense? Wait a minute, wait a minute. 
Mm-hmm. You walk through the door, you have to leave logic behind. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm trying to think why is that a restaurant when, you know, they just want providers sign for it. And, you know, they don't really know. Because it's a whole other agency. Yeah, it's a, that's a whole different. And, again, there are also webinars just on that topic because that's something you could go down the rabbit hole on very, very quickly in understanding why these changes have happened with EPSDT and why EPSDT is written the way that it is. You are so good at saying that. Um, it's, yeah, uh, I've only said it 8,000 times. Um, so people asked about uh, other agencies. So again, a clarification, we're not really talking about other agencies. We were mentioning other resources to find care providers. So care.com was the website that was mentioned, and Donna's PSA Match Program were the resources other than that kind of outside the box, creative networking sorts of things. Um, a question here, which is a good one, can the parent of an adult child be the employer of record and the attendant? And the simple answer is no. You cannot be both the employer who signs the timesheets and the attendant who fills out the timesheets. There is a significant conflict of interest there. So that's not an option. So if, for example, mom is the employer of record, mom cannot also be the care attendant. That's never going to be allowed. Um, can a parent be listed as the primary caregiver and the attendant? Yes. You can be the caregiver who's usually unpaid, except for now the fact that this child with a disability is over 18 and you would like to be paid for some of these hours and you go through all these hoops to get that authorized. Yes, so you can be the caregiver and the paid attendant, but you couldn't also be the employer of record. There are only so many hats you're allowed to wear. Um, and then the other question that got sent in here is, can you review the resources where a family can find providers? And so I wasn't quite sure what kind of provider that was. So feel free to send in that question again. So we talked about care.com and the PSA match as formal vehicles for going out and finding someone you've never met and have no contact with. And a lot of the kind of creative ideas we talked about here and that are in the guide about look in your neighborhood newsletter, look at your kids' high school friends, look at teachers' aides, look at other people who have been a part of their life, staff who works with them in other situations, working in the evenings, local college students, all those kinds of things are the other things that are enumerated in that resource guide as creative places to check. And I just want to mention about the EOR, if it's mom um, that's EOR, and then wants to become intendant, she could always the uh, employer of record. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, that if, say, for example, dad is living in the home, she can just switch and just make dad the EOR or an adult sibling. Mm-hmm. Can the um, EOR, can one EOR do uh, for another family yeah. that she did for her? Her home, her husband, and then she did for friends. I so, think that's George. Can you be an employer of record for someone outside of your family? So, for example, if a mom had a child named John who had a waiver, and another mom down the street had a child named Smith who had a waiver, could John's mom be Smith's employer of record? Yes, but keep in mind what you're signing up to do as employer of record is. You're signing timesheets. You're verifying that time that that care attendant was in and out of the house, and you are legally obligated to do that ethically, morally, correctly. So you want to make sure these are people you are in close enough touch with that you feel like, I know exactly when you were and were not in this house, and when you did and did not call out, and all these kinds of things I want to be signing off on, and you're hiring and keeping track of all your paperwork. So there's certainly an arrangement where it may make sense to do that. It may be advantageous. It's a lot to take on and a lot of responsibility if it's not happening right under your own nose and it's not what you'd be doing already. I did it for two uh, families a while ago, two other families. One, there was a single mom with two children with disabilities, and so I was the employer of record for one of the child. Mm -hmm. Um, And then for the other family, there was uh, a father, but he wanted nothing to do with this whole Medicaid thing. So I did it for the mother. I have since stopped doing that, and I forget why, the reason, (laughs) a a legal thing that came down. So I would double check that you're able to do that because, I don't know, this was before the waiver change, so I think there was a reason, there was a rule, they made a new rule, but they may have rescinded that rule. So double check it. Also, the individual themselves could be their own employer. Yes. Yes, thank you. Obviously, if a person with a disability doesn't need help signing off on those timesheets and can work with their other service facilitator, their BPL person, their uh, support coordinator, everybody else, and they don't need someone else to do that for them, yes, please, by all means. Mm -hmm. Also, with all the timesheet stuff, I I refuse, refuse to use paper because it's one more piece of paper in my life. So if they want to work for me, Baji does it on his phone, actually. It can be all online. 
Uh, it's not a paper thing. Did the thing ever change? You know, so there's something they were proposing where they were trying to make it more difficult to verify hours, where um, okay. there were. There's a period of time. On the current um, format of how you sign off time, where we're like the attendant had to like log in in the morning when they came versus it's the, that's the electronic I mean, yeah. so yeah. I, I want to actually let her ask a question because she's been waiting and then we'll loop back to something about an update on this. Yes. Hi. I was under the impression like two years ago that they stopped EOR from being an EOR for more than one family. Agreed. You could be an EOR if two individuals lived in the same home. Let's say you have twin sisters lived in the same home, an EOR could be an EOR for those two. But if by some reason they lived in two separate houses, you weren't allowed. So Makes sense. Right. You're right. So that was the rule. So just to clarify so folks on the phone can hear that if you're an employer of record, you can't be the employer of record for multiple people in multiple households, right? You, if you, had, you were a parent, for example, and you had multiple children with disabilities living in your house, you could be employer of record for all of them, but once they grew up and they moved to their own apartment, we're now looking at multiple people, multiple households, that's not going to fly anymore. You're right. So then you'd be looking at needing a new employer of record. Um, there was a question here about electronic visit verification, and that's another thing. Again, we have whole webinars and other sections on this because every piece of this is really complicated. There was a federal law that passed. Uh, mandating that consumer directed style services, and this is across the country, it's a federal ruling, um, have to have an electronic visit verification, which is a, effectively an electronic timesheet, a way of ensuring that the care attendant did show up to work, what time, what were they doing, where were they, where was the person with a the disability, these kind, kind of boxes that need to be checked. Um, Virginia authorized funding for this because we had to. It's a federal mandate. Um, but it won't be rolled out in Virginia until October 1 of 2019, so just under a year from now. And that decision to delay it until October of next year is new. There have been a lot of chatter about putting out January 1 of 2019, and very clearly we are not prepared to do that. <laughs> so October 1 of 2019. Too about people fighting back against it and worried about it and whatever, and I just want to say that my nurses use an electronic verification and they have for like six years and it's never, they don't use it to check up on us or where we are. No, it's not like camera monitoring or anything of that nature to be clear. No, it's not GPS driven. So um, we certainly as the ARC will be doing a lot more pushing out of information and webinars and workshops for families on whatever system Virginia ultimately selects That's the and how to use it. Because Virginia could select something that was GPS whatever. But you know the whole groups are saying please don't do that, or we don't think that's the right thing to do. Yeah, there's privacy issues. It's hard enough to get attendance. <laughs> so this is a great question online. So if we live in a rural area, can we reimburse our care attendants for mileage and other kinds of transportation and outing expenses? And Medicaid won't do it. Medicaid will say either we'll pay you for your mileage or we'll pay you for your time, and you would much rather have them pay obviously for that person's time. But yes. You can, in the same way any employer can reimburse their employees, you as the family can say, yeah, a requirement of this job is that we're going to ask you to drive and re we'll reimburse you at 56 cents a mile or whatever it is that the federal reimbursement rate is, whatever you all agree on that's reasonable and ethical. No, no one should have to like spend money to function at their job, right? And so if you say your job today is to go to the movies, and Kimberly and Donna had mentioned this, then the family's job would be to pay for that care attendance ticket to right. the movies, right? You wouldn't say like, oh, it's going to cost you two hours of your job today to drive this person around and to pay for your own movie ticket and right. pay, you know, right. reimburse so, the people for so, expenses. Mm -hmm. You know, lunch tickets, the yeah. activities, all of that you, you would pay for your attendance. Um, but just for the rural area mm -hmm. thing, that not going to and from work, would, you don't get mileage for that. Mm -hmm. But if you were, we have, we have a lot of um, PSAs who, can take our, our club members, we call them, but their clients in their own car, in the attendance car, yes, that's when you get reimbursed for mileage. Kristen has an accessible van and she can't go in another vehicle, and so um, our attendants do not get any mileage to take Kristen all over town because she's Roger. in her own Don't car. get any ideas. Yeah, because they're taking, yeah, because so it's the family van. If that person's <laughs> attendant is using their vehicle, and also, by the way, um, that is something that each insurance company is different about. It's not a problem. Um, some of our families have had 
um, to do something, I mean, as much as pay $15 a month for their personal support attendant to have a rider on their policy that they are, they are doing a little chauffeuring for a job. No special license, no other things. Some insurance companies don't require that at all, um, and a couple of them did, and that's the only, we, we went through that um, at Spark, but uh, you, have to, you have to check out that transportation piece, but mileage is only available if the person is using their own private vehicle and not your vehicle. So Another question I get a lot um, uh, about paying the people is people want to pay them more than 1193 So timely, Kimberly. Mm -hmm. um, so what you can do is you can have them work five hours a day for 1193 an hour, and then they would work the extra two hours at $40 an hour that you would pay. So Medicaid you only charge. I mean, they only get paid for the twelve dollars, uh, let's say, and then they you pay them an extra high salary for the two that they work for you privately to cover that if you choose to do so. So just to, and this is written out in the guide too. But to reiterate, Medicaid waiver, like we talked about, is going to pay for that care attendant for a certain number of hours per week. If you choose to hire that same person for hours above and beyond that. You can choose, like you would pay your gardener or your cleaning lady or your whatever else, you choose the rate because then you're hiring them and you're paying them and you're setting their schedule. If you're doing that outside of the hours that you're authorized in billing waiver, absolutely you can. And you can say exactly as Kimberly said, you know, I value your time at $40 an hour, so when you take it on average, your $11.93 an hour from okay, waiver plus, right, plus my $40 an hour, this is what it averages out to be, but know that the hours that you're working for the waiver, you're submitting a timesheet for those through Medicaid, and Medicaid's only going to pay you $11.93 an hour, and I'm not going to pay you any more than that. If you choose to work additional hours with me, you get reimbursed at a higher rate, and you can look at it as an average if you'd like. And if you want to say, this is all too complicated, I'm just going to give her extra $10 an hour for the time that she works for Medicaid. You are risking your future with Medicaid. That is considered Medicaid fraud, and you can. And if they catch you doing it, or you only can submit the timesheet for the hours they worked at that reimbursement rate. You, you can cannot pay, pay them you can't, above. Can't subsidize them during those work hours. You have to say, I'm hiring you outside of these hours. Yes. It has to be a very clean break. Very clean break. Okay. If you're coming in from 12 to 5. And you're going to make 11.97 an hour on the Medicaid waiver. You cannot give somebody five dollars an hour from 12 to five to supplement. You must say no. After five o'clock, I will hire you for X amount of dollars per hour to compensate for that. It's it's an accounting thing. And you also While we were talking about money. You don't want to say compensate. Right. You want to say I'm paying you forty dollars an hour. Obviously privately right. for these three hours. So the other thing is um, somebody is mentioning respite. And I know um, our, you know, we have 480 hours a year, as, as Lucy's been talking about. And um, however, our caregiver who is our CCC plus paid caregiver, and we turn in our time cards to PPL, she can only work 40 hours a week, even though that respite money is a different bucket of money. Mm -hmm. She cannot have that money. So we have to hire a separate person. We have a weekend person, and that's how we tap into the rest of the money. You can't do more than 40. However, if you hire somebody through an agency, they can have overtime. The end of that. If the agency is willing to if pay the overtime. If the agency is willing to do it. But that's the only legal way to have overtime. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a little odd question. I, I think I might have heard it um, at another workshop. So say you have two children that are um, with disabilities. And you have uh, one attendant that's there that's kind of also just there making sure they're both safe. There's not a, like a program where they get paid the regular rate for one child and then, you know, for the second child it's at a like 6% prorated where they can buy and get paid higher than the, you know, 11, 90, whatever. Yeah, so the questions that folks heard, so for example, if you had a situation where there were multiple people and the example was given two children with disabilities in the same home, could the care attendant be billing for both those people simultaneously and, for example, get double the hourly rate or some kind of prorated version for that person? And the answer is no. Um, the personal care attendant service in the Medicaid regulations is a one-to-one -one service. So they're saying this one personal care attendant is working with this one person with a disability and that's what this service is. So there's no additional people that we're paying them to serve in any way, shape, or form at the same time. Over 
from GPL to the new company? Uh, GD, uh, sure. So uh, yes, we don't I know. I understand, but then I get confused when Kimberly mentioned about the CPL. So it is confusing. So the question about um, the move from PPL to an additional fiscal agent, a new PPL, if you will, is happening if you have only if you have either the CCC Plus waiver and Magellan, in which case you're moving to a group called ACES, who's going to do that, or if you have one of the three DD waivers, the Community Living, Family and Individual Supports and Building Independence waiver, all of the DD waiver people are moving to a group called Consumer Directed Care Network. I am going to hopefully share my screen here. Can we see my screen here? Not yet. There we are. Okay. So the ID waiver doesn't exist anymore. It's been morphed into those DD waivers so about two years ago. Yep. So the consumerdirectva.com is the website for Consumer Directed Care Network, the new place to go. And if you go there, uh, there's a link right at the top for form. And here are the forms that they're having people fill out to jump from PPL to them. And again, that jump happens on January 1st of 2019 for people using the DD waivers exclusively. And there's packets for each attendant and a packet for the employer. So that is generally the employer is usually the parent, whoever the employer of record is now, assuming you want it to be the same person. And they have samples of those forms and instructions on how to send them secure emails. So that if you're sending an information or an email saying like, I'm the EOR for this person that has this many hours and you're disclosing personal information, you would obviously want to send that securely so it couldn't be intercepted. Um, so that's the best place to start now and their contact information is there as well. Um, you're certainly welcome to start asking them questions and getting, uh, figuring out how things are going to be working. We don't know how things are going to be working. This is a historic move in Virginia to move away from PPL. Uh, so I don't have a super clear answer for you on that, but this is a great place to start. And in terms of talking about your care attendants, getting paperwork filled out and getting ready for this transition, this is where you want to be going in the paperwork that you want to be using to be ready for that transition. And when is that effective? January 1st? No, October. Of, of 2019. January 1, 2019 <coughs> is when this change happens. And then I think that's just Magellan's easy. I think PPL lost their contract with Medicaid. PPL did lose their contract with Medicaid. Yeah. Mm. In Virginia. So coming into effect of January 21, how long does the processing take? So should we do it like at least like 30 days out or is there a... Well, my feeling is the forms are available now. The question is how long should we be in advance should we be doing this? If the forms are available now, I fill out the forms and submit the forms now because there are many, many thousands of people, about 14,000 people across the state who use DD waivers. So there's going to come a time at which the majority of those people are submitting these forms, and that's probably going to be like the last days of December when everyone's on holiday vacation and fax machines are going down and things are crazy. So the sooner the better. Um, there's no harm in doing it, and everybody's got to do it at some point before January 1. And you want to get in ahead of the crowd. By December 3rd. Um, I was going to mention great update. Have them in by December 3rd. Gotten letters, but not all of them. I have, and this is the first I've heard of it here so. today. I've yeah. so that's why I was like, I'm and then surprised. The family get confused because they're not sure if they are transitioning over. If the syndicator doesn't tell them. I know. So it's a, and I would say there was a question about a lot of confusion about this. It is confusing, and it is possible your service facilitator does not know. When I was saying Medicaid puts out a memo and then people are expected to find it and learn it and train everybody on it, this is exactly what I was talking about. This just came out like 30 days ago in a memo, and now folks here in the room happen to have the letter say by December 3rd, you have to have all this new paperwork in. That's ridiculous. Yeah. So again, keep in mind that the website I just showed now has example forms up, and those are new to help people figure out how to fill it out. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Medicaid memo came out on October 1st yeah. explaining this process. Mm -hmm. On October 26th, there was a service facilitator in a Medicaid and a PPL phone conference. And the service facilitators were very angry because a training was set up that was canceled. Then it was set up again and then it was canceled. Wow. It was for the service facilitators to be educated how they could support the families, and it got canceled and it got turned into a webinar that's taking place next week, Wednesday. Um, some service facilitators were 
aware that the changes were coming about, but they had no idea the specifics of it and how they could support the family. Yeah, so just um, to reiterate for folks on the phone, the training that was supposed to be going on for service facilitators, not super well advertised, canceled multiple times, lots of confusion going on. I would say this is not atypical of a change related to Medicaid. What was that Oh, hold on. We had one other person who raised their hand. Yeah. It's probably a dumb question. <laughs> we have no idea whether we would expect a disruption in services. Whether to expect a disruption in services. Because it is Medicaid and because anytime Medicaid changes something, I would say, yep, yeah, I would brace for a disruption in services. The official stance from Medicaid is there should not be a disruption in services. So there's not necessarily going to be one, but given track records, I think likely. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so hard on, on it's hard on it's causing hard because he doesn't get a paycheck How do you do that? and there's nothing you can do yeah, it's right the communication I mean you're you know public your um, facility but if they don't know or I, have to, I, have oh, to, I can't relate that to you. This is a good question about the overtime. So good question catching on the overtime. If a care attendant, for example, works over a weekend and works 48 straight hours, right? Let's say parents are gone over the weekend and the care attendant stays the whole time. Can they bill 40 hours uh, of regular and then eight more hours of regular and just not get paid overtime? And the answer is no. A federal rule from the Department of Labor changed on this. And this happened in 2016, I believe, meaning that the care attendant if you're earning more than 40 hours, by law you are entitled to overtime. Because Virginia Medicaid won't pay them overtime, you're right. stuck at 40 hours. So this is because Virginia Medicaid hasn't chosen to fund that overtime. So uh, this could be different in other states. It is different, but no. With care attendance through Consumer Directed Services on the waiver, 40 hours is your ceiling per week on the pay period, and you'll look at whatever your pay period is. Uh, and that's the absolute maximum that they can work and bill Medicaid during that time period because Medicaid will not fund overtime and they have to be paid overtime if they work it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was kind of telling you about. Yeah. Like our family budget includes some of those, those hits that we know we have to take in the year. If Raji works 35 hours for us in a week and works for a different family, how dare he, <laughs> for like 20 hours that same week, he can get paid for 50 whatever hours. 58 hours, right. yeah. But none of it is right. over, over. Because it's technically two different right. employers, right? When we're saying employer of record, that means you, the parent, or the person with a disability, or whoever is the employer. So when they're working, even if it's the same job, you can work at Burger King McDonald's, right? <laughs> you can do the same job at two different places, but because you have two different employers, you don't add those hours together and get overtime. It's exactly as Kimberly said, Raj, you could work for two different people with waiver. And so long as he was under 40 hours with each of those employers of record, each of those clients, he would be okay. But he wouldn't get overtime. Right. He would just get straight time. It, it, it's a shame. It, it really is a shame. It's actually illegal, but um, it, it's, it's, it's but our, our, our morning caregiver has, you know, she does, uh, she takes, uh, supports Kristen, and then she has a child. Um, she gets off the school bus in the afternoon. So it is like changing of the guard at our house. And, um, you know, that's, I, I get sad when I see that, you know, these wonderful people who are trying to earn a living wage are, you know, really hit a brick wall a lot because we know my daughter takes more than eight hours in a day <laughs> of people's time, so it's tough. So, so, um, so uh, CL waiver is uh, not affected by the new system. Which new system are you asking about? Uh, the, um, the, uh, Not PPL. It is because it's one of the DD waivers. So the Community Living Waiver, like I said, is one of those three DD waivers, Community Living, Family and Individual Supports, and Building Independence Waiver, and they are all affected by this move to the new agency. So, uh, so notes from folks online who have already called the Consumer Directed Care Network, that group we were talking about, be aware they're on Montana time because they're based in Montana. <laughs> uh, and they're still working on setting things up in Virginia. Again, this Medicaid memo came out in October. That's when things, the news dropped. So this is very new. Uh, and they said that it usually takes six months to set up services in a new state, and Virginia wants it done in three. So to your point about whether or not there are likely to be gaps or issues, I would say that's probably very telling. Uh, and the person here said that they asked the person at Consumer Directed Care Network about filling out those forms in some of the places they were confused and they were very helpful. Again, I would say do that sooner rather than later because, of course, the closer we get to that date, the more people are going to be doing it and calling. We're going to have delays. Um, and that if you call back that they can tell you that the forms are processed. 
All I right. think the question that I would want to know mm -hmm. is, um, is if there is a gap in services, would, would there be retroactive, you know, would timesheets be able to be submitted and how they're going to handle that? But I have to tell you, um, we would have many families lose caregivers because we have caregivers that can't not have a paycheck for four yeah. to six weeks or something. It's really wonderful to say we'll get. So um, I do know that some families have had to um, pay their personal support and They've made arrangements that, hey, when you get your retroactive check, can, you know, can, I, can I get this back or whatever? But these are the things you have to legitimately be prepared for and just kind That's of ask point. the right questions because I, I, you know, there's nobody at Spark who isn't doing this to pay their mortgage, to pay okay. their car payments and that kind of thing, and you can't just go on hold. And it's the only industry I know that, that people just say, oh, well, you know, you're not going to get a paycheck for a couple months you know, deal with it, and uh, it's, it's wrong. It's really wrong. Um, another question, does the overtime rule pertain to family members living in the same household as the person with a disability? Yes. yes. It's a federal rule saying anyone working this job, effectively being consumer-directed care network, gets a uh, consumer-directed care attendant, gets paid overtime after 40 hours, and that's a blanket rule. Um, yeah. We've got lots of people working over 40 if they're living in the same house. If they're a live-in care attendant, that's right. a different kind of thing than just happen to reside in the same house. And it depends upon how the service, so like are they a live-in caregiver for residential services? For example, is it two people sharing an apartment together? And it's a person with a disabilities apartment and that caregiver's on the lease? There's lots of complications that kind of go along with that. But I would say like always checking with your service facility or checking with your support coordinator about your individual situation because Department of Labor rules on this, like I said, changed very recently. And there's lots of that getting fleshed out. And there was another question about clarifying the date that the transition needs to be completed from PPL to Consumer Directed Care Network. December 3rd is what someone in the room very helpfully said is the date that Consumer Directed Care Network needs your paperwork to have it processed so that in an ideal world, all my fingers and toes are crossed right now, January 1, you're not adding any blips when the official changeover happens and they are starting to process timesheets and all that kind of business. Um, we are out of time here, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. I'll share some other resources here on the screen. Our care attendant guide is on our website and you can see that here. Like I mentioned, we have lots and lots and lots of recorded webinars on all kinds of waivers and EPSCT and HIP and all kinds of programs and complications here on our YouTube channel. We have a 24-7 Ask the Arc portal where you get an automatic reply with some basic answers to questions and then an expert staff person will follow up with you personally to get in touch with you about whatever your question is. And then this is the link to the forms that I showed you all about Consumer Directed Care Network who's taking over. So with that, um, thank you all very much and we look forward to seeing you at future events. Thank you. Please stand by.